they're going to do. And then when it comes time to discharge those commitments, can't get themselves to vote. Are just overcome by what? What they want to do right then. So they, I mean, one way of thinking about it is that they don't, uh, in an important sense, they don't see themselves as sort of extending through time. They just are pushed around by the inclinations or desires they happen to have as they come over. There's no self-discipline. There's no making themselves regular. There's no responsibility. They're buffeted around by the inclinations as they come over. OK, well, so the person who is uh, a sovereign individual is responsible, um, uh, is regular, has an extended will, is self-disciplined enough to be able to make a commitment and follow through with that commitment, well, such a person is going to treat such a weak individual into things with contempt. That they're, they're not going to trust such an individual. They're going to see that the only thing that will motivate them to act is force. The only thing that's going to motivate them to act is to configure the forces on their desires, on their desires, to get them to do the whatever it is that they're committed to. Because they don't have the self-discipline to do this. Okay. So let's go back to this, the bottom of 36. This being who has become free, who is really permitted to promise, this Lord of the free will, the sovereign, Lord of the free, free will, that is able to get himself to do something rather than just being buffeted around by the inclinations that he happens to feel at the moment. How could the sovereign, how could he not know what superiority he thus has over all else that's not permitted to promise and vouch for itself? How much trust, how much fear, how much reverence he awakens? He earns all three. And how this mastery over himself also necessarily brings with it mastery over circumstances, over nature and lesser, all lesser willed and more unreliable creatures. The free human being, the possessor of a long, unbreakable will, has in, his, in this possession his standard of value as well. Looking from himself toward the others, he honors or holds them in contempt, depending on whether they're responsible or not, depending on whether they have long will or not, depending on whether they have self-discipline and control or not. And just as necessarily as he honors the ones like him, the ones who are responsible, the strong and reliable, those who are permitted to promise, that is, Everyone who, who promises like sovereign, like a, like a sovereign, weightily, solemnly, slowly, who is stingy with his trust, who conveys a mark of distinction when he trusts, who gives his word as something on which one can rely because he knows himself to be strong enough to uphold it even against accidents, changes of circumstances, even against fate. Okay, so this is the sort of primary affirmation of those who are sovereign individuals who are strong enough to discipline themselves, discipline themselves to carry out their commitments. Just as necessarily, he will hold his kick in readiness for the frail dogs who promise although they are not permitted to do so, and his switch, or his switch, for the liar who breaks his word already the moment it leaves his mouth. The proud knowledge of this extraordinary privilege of responsibility, the consciousness of this rare freedom, this power over oneself and fate, has sunk into his lowest depth and has become instinct, the dominant instinct. The dominant instinct. Okay, so. Um, I want you to notice, I mean, Nietzsche's here talking about sort of 
domination, um, this dominant instinct. I want you to notice the kind of domination that is at stake here and that Nietzsche admires. It's the power over oneself. It's the power to get yourself to do what you're committed to, to carry out your, so to speak, earlier will, even in circumstances where you don't want to, where you don't feel like it, where you have desires that if you simply acted on what you felt like doing, you would do something else. So the dominance here is the ability to make a commitment and hold on to it despite changing circumstances. Um, and this is what Nietzsche is most admiring here. Should I ask again for an example of that we've seen here in the first treatise about who has this ability? This dominance of themselves, this self-discipline. I asked last time, and the answer is the same. I mean, uh, reading the stuff, what are you talking about like, the most prior stuff? This is going to be some something related. This is going to be sort of what so this is what the aesthetic ideal is going to nurture. But we see it in the exam. He just starts the first treatise talking about certain individuals who discipline themselves and are heroic for the English, the English psychologists, of course. Those are sovereign individuals who are committed to meticulous scientific work. Even, or so he imagines, even if they don't feel like it at the moment. Right? They've self, they've disciplined themselves to look with a clear and cold eye at all of the truths of human psychology, even the ugly ones. Even if they don't like what it looks like. So this is exactly the kind of self-discipline that he's talking about. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm cut off right before the punchline here. The proud knowledge of the extraordinary privilege of responsibility, the consciousness of this rare freedom, this power over oneself and fate. Suppose this power, this self discipline, this awareness of oneself as entitled to make commitments uh, and carry them out to. Uh, control one's fate, to know that if I say I will do something, in the future I will do it. Suppose this knowledge, this capacity, this power, has sunk into his lowest depth and has become instinct, the dominant instinct. So, so I'm strong enough that I'm genuinely motivated to do that. Maybe it's not even a struggle to overcome my maybe contrary inclinations. What will he call it, his dominant instinct? Assuming that he feels the need to have a word for it. There is no doubt. This sovereign human being calls it his conscience. So conscience is the self-discipline to act, in this case, as one's committed, even when one doesn't feel like it. One recognizes, so to speak, that this is the right thing to do. And one is strong enough to do the right thing, even if one doesn't feel like it. OK, so the question now is, and which I say yet again, is this something he's praising? This is the, the strength of self-discipline that creates a sovereign individual who's capable of controlling fate. Well, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but in this limited way, yes. All right, so the question now is, where did this come from? How did, the, how did a conscience as the strength of self-discipline emerge. To be permitted to vouch for oneself and with pride 
and hence to be permitted to say yes to oneself too. That is, as noted, he says, a ripe fruit, also a late fruit. This is what the entire prehistory of human existence was building up to, generating conscience. How long this fruit had to hang on the tree, harsh and sour, and for a still much longer time, no one, uh, so, sorry, and still much longer time, one could see nothing of such fruit. So this, look, this internalization of dominance took a long time to occur. Initially, for a long time, mostly most of the prehistory of our existence, there wasn't that kind of internal strength. That means there was external force. Um, and this is what Nietzsche is saying here. Um, as one, from line 30, page uh, 37. As one can imagine, the answer how we came to have a conscience, that is, how we came to have the strength of self-discipline to overcome the desires we have in the field. As one can imagine, the answers and means used to solve this age-old problem were not exactly delicate. There is perhaps nothing more terrible and uncanny in all of man's history than this technique, this um, method. Namely, one burns something in so that it remains in one's memory. Only what does not cease to give pain remains in one's memory. And this, he says, is a first principle from the most ancient, unfortunately also the longest, psychology on earth. Only what does not cease to give pain remains in one another. And this is a terrible thought, he says. It's an uncanny thought, he says. Um, this is the most ancient, unfortunately, also the longest psychology. Um, so this idea of burning into our consciousness uh, a memory of pain that the way to internalize a certain kind of strength is through external imposition of pain. Well, I mean, you might, I mean, you might imagine, you might imagine Nietzsche sort of tittering and laughing about this. Um, that something he might say with delight that human beings only remember what's burned into them. But look what he says about this. He says this is a terrible fact about human psychology. It's something that unfortunately has lasted the longest. Um, and the thought that an idea must be burned into our memory using um, Pain continues um, over on to 38, fourth line. He says, whenever man considered it necessary to make a memory for himself, it was never done without blood, torment, and sacrifice. The most gruesome sacrifices and pledges, such as, for example, to which sacrifices of the firstborn belong, the most repulsive mutilations, castrations, for example, the cruelest ritual forms of all religious cults, and all religions are in their deepest foundations and systems of cruelty. All of this has its origin in that instinct that it intuited in pain, the most powerful of all mnemonics. In a certain sense, he says, the entirety of asceticism belongs here, in this psychological principle. Um, so Nietzsche, I want to say again, is clearly delighted with the outcome. The creation of a sovereign individual is uh, the highest accomplishment. But 
it sure does not seem like he's taking any kind of pleasure or satisfaction.